Speaking of soul, I have the pleasure of speaking with our next um, awardee. Um, we're so thankful that she sees the souls of our young people. The next award of the night, the Lifetime Achievement, will now be presented to Diana Byer. To give you insight into Diana's life and career, we have on-screen presenter Linda Murray. Linda is currently the curator of the Jerome Robbins Dance Division at the Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center, where she manages all aspects of its collections and public service. She has previously worked with the dance collections at the Library of Congress and ran a multidisciplinary arts organization in Washington, D.C. for seven years. Her areas of specific interest include 20th century ballet and gender in performance. Please bring your attention to the video screens for a tribute to the wonderful Diana Byer. Thank you. Diana had the great privilege of training directly with Anthony Tudor when she was a student at Juilliard in the 1960s. Something that I know had an immense impact on her and has influenced her own trajectory as both a dancer and then as an artistic director. She was trained directly by Margaret Krask and Margaret Krask in turn was trained directly by Enrico Cicchetti. I believe she lives by Anthony Tudor's people who happen to be dancing rather than dancers who are trying to be people. That's central to the way that she tries to impart knowledge about dance. And I know that also musicality is incredibly important to her too. few other companies I can think of beyond New York Theatre Ballet that have such an eclectic mix of pieces in their repertory. When you go to see New York Theatre Ballet, you really do get a breath of scope in both aesthetic and artistic ideas. It's the only company I can think of where a David Gordon piece, a Pam Tanowitz piece, a Merce Cunningham piece, and an Agnes DeMille piece might find their way into one evening. And it's not just the choreography that she is turning her attention to, but also the entire design of that original work. 
She researches the costumes, the sets, and really tries to find a way to bring the original intent of the choreographer back onto the stage for a 21st century audience. The work that she has done with children who are at risk and living in shelters is absolutely extraordinary. It is one of the most endearing moments of this holiday season. Children dancing the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies. Eyewitness News photographer Bob Kakamis set his viewfinder on one special group of dance students from the Ballet School in New York as they prepared for the Nutcracker Suite. That's it. So you want that there. The whole class is made up with children from every walk of life imaginable. And we get a real mix. We get very wealthy people and we get in our Project Lift, which is the scholarship project for children from the city shelters, we get children that have no material wealth whatsoever. My mom and I and my brother live in a battered women's, women's shelter. My family, they tell me, you know, practice, practice. And I know that it has come at great personal cost to her in ways that most of us don't realize. The scholarships that she offers extend beyond what the company can afford, and I know that she herself supplements those scholarships to make sure that the children have what they need, the clothes that they need, the food that they need, in order to be able to come to class and to learn how to dance. Uh, that is an incredible gift that she has given many generations of children in New York, and it's a legacy that few others would be able to think of attaining. Diana gave up her artistic directorship of New York Theatre Ballet after her spring season last year, but I know that that won't slow her down. I'm aware that Diana still intends to teach, and I know that she has a secret desire to form a dance company for dancers who are over the age of 60, which is something I would very much like to see. And if anybody can figure out how to continue telling stories through dance for many more years, it's Diana. Diana, congratulations on receiving the Martha Hill Award. I cannot think of a more deserving recipient for the many, many ways that you have enriched the dance field, students, professional dancers, and audience members. You have given a great gift to all of us, and I'm just, I'm delighted that you're having this moment of recognition, and well done. <laughs> by her longtime friend David Vaughan. And for those of you who don't know who David Vaughan was, although I think most of this room does, he was the longtime archivist for Merce Cunningham. And when I started as the dance curator at the New York Public Library, David was our dance historian in residence. David was a fellow expat, and we bonded over our shared love of Ashton, Tudor, and several other choreographers who are often neglected in the American repertory. And that was when David directed me to check out Diana's company, New York Theatre Valley. And what I found there was remarkable. It was a small company of beautifully trained dancers performing one of the most eclectic programs I had ever seen. And outside of the sheer breadth of the company's repertory, as a dance historian, what really impressed me was the dialogue that she created by placing apparent outliers in the same evening and that's just incredibly important for knitting together the connective threads of our all too fragile dance history. 
As I got to know Diana as a person, I saw how deep her passion for dance goes, and I understood what a general soul, generous soul she is. As you saw, the work that she has done for at-risk youth in New York City is extraordinary, and it has opened up young lives to art, possibility, and opportunity. Um, and I just, I don't think that we will ever be able to repay her that debt. Diana's company is now in the hands of Stephen Melendez, one of Diana's protégés, and a testament to the investment that she has made in the young people of New York. As her company starts a new chapter, I am delighted that the Martha Hill Award has been given to Diana at this moment, not as an endpoint as a lifetime achievement sometimes might indicate, but as a moment of acknowledgement for a decades-long career that has defined what it means to live a life in dance. So please welcome me now, and please join me now in welcoming Diana to the stage. is set such a high standard and I'm so honored by your generosity. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Martha Hill Dance Fund and the countless friends who have supported me along the way. They're all <laughs> I am deeply honored to be here in the company of Diane McIntyre and Deborah Damast. I am profoundly grateful for this award for many reasons, but one of the principal reasons might surprise you. During my first year at Juilliard, Ms. Hill actually kicked me out of the school for bad behavior. <laughs> I never ever went to classes on Fridays. <laughs> Instead, I took the train to Trent, New Jersey, my hometown, to meet my friends. One of them is here right there, Joe. We've been friends for 65 years. Um, and I went to the dances run by DJ Jerry Blavitt, aka the Geeter with the Heater, the Big Boss with the Hot Sauce. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey, so you can understand. <laughs> um, I was a wild child, and I guess I still am, but everything that followed, including crossing paths with Miss Hill again, has led me here. So maybe Miss Hill instinctively knew something about me and what I needed. After my very brief stint as a full-time student at Juilliard, I entered the Extension Division and studied with Anthony Tudor, Alfredo Corvino, Sarah Stackhouse, Betty Jones, Helen McGee, and Mary Hinkson. I can't believe how extraordinarily lucky I was to be studying with the very best of the best. I also met Margaret Krask, who became my lifelong teacher, mentor, and very dear friend. So barely in my 20s, these were the people who inspired me and shaped my artistic taste. During this time, Ms. Hill was always there in the background, working tirelessly, and always making a meaningful, lasting difference. She kept Juilliard's dance department alive, despite attempts to shut it down. And she succeeded through sheer will, unwavering courage, and the force of her impressive personality. It was her presence at this school that truly informed my understanding of what was possible in life. In the 1970s, not many people, not many women were running ballet companies, but in 1978, at the age of 32, I established New York Theatre Ballet in the New York Theatre Ballet School because I had Miss Hill as a role model. Wow. Everyone knew Miss 
Hill's opinion because she was never afraid to speak her mind and to ensure that her ideas were heard. Everyone witnessed her courage as she fought for programs and individuals she believed in and always won. Everyone saw her vision as she nurtured and transformed dance training for the 20th century. In 1978, I had just returned from dancing in Canada and several friends had returned from Europe. We all needed a place to dance and to choreograph, so I created that place. Miss Hill had shown me that I could do anything I wanted through committed hard work, courage, generosity of spirit, and uncompromisingly high ideals. This is the legacy of Martha Hill for me, and one that I hope I carried on during my 40 plus years directing New York Theatre Ballet. You know, of course the world changes and we must change with it to some degree, or risk becoming buried in the past. But I do believe in principles that are universal and should never change. Ms. Hill sometimes asked a question that distilled many of these principles. Do you love the art more? or do you love yourself more? For Ms. Hill, the answer was always the art. For the headstrong, wild child in me, the answer is always the art. If my own students answer the same, I know I will have achieved something worthwhile. We all need a Ms. Hill in our lives so that the art of dance will grow and thrive. And I am thrilled to have had her in mind. And I'm so honored to receive her award. Thank you.